The doctor will see you now. Any points on lockdown or the vaccine, the lines are now open because I am joined by the one and only Dr. Ranjit Bra. Dr. Bra, thanks for joining us. Let me say right at the beginning that you do so despite the fact, or maybe because of the fact, uh, that your own wife and children are all now suffering from the coronavirus. Uh, tell us first how they are, please. Thanks, George. Good to be with you, and, and thank you for your well wishes. Um, yes, that's true. So I'm sadly, uh, so I'm I I don't have uh, the coronavirus. My tests are negative. I've had two doses of the of the vaccine, which I've received in my capacity as a frontline healthcare worker, and my second um, soon after Christmas, and therefore I'm likely to be immune. Though the exact efficacy is not clear. My wife um, is also an NHS surgeon. She has had a dose of the vaccine, but only one, uh, and only two to three weeks ago. Uh, and as we're seeing from a study, um, or data at least, re released of all places from Israel, which has, has, has a large um, vaccine rollout, we can maybe discuss the best, that. The best in the world. Uh, and second is the UAE. That's right. Well, and of course, controversially best in the world, because, of course, they're not vaccinating the Palestinian population, again, revealing the underlying truth of their apartheid system. They're very much in control of the Palestinian borders, of course, uh, and the Palestinian finances uh, and the, the Palestinian territory, but not uh, giving the protection of the, of the vaccine uh, to the Palestinian people. But in any case, the data that they are um, showing uh, may suggest that one dose of the vaccine actually is really not very efficacious. They're, they're putting forward, there was an article in the BMJ I read uh, on Friday, which suggests that it's as low as 30% if you have a single dose. Uh, but we, hopeful perhaps that what it will mean is that those who have had even a single dose will have a milder spectrum of disease. And so whilst that is test proven positives, it may be that there's still a, a good effect on mortality, which is, of course, and, and serious illness, which is the thing we're most worried about. So, yeah, my, my wife has had a, had a vaccine dose. Unfortunately, despite that, she's tested positive. Um, she tests herself regularly. Uh, she was due to have an operating list and couldn't attend that. Uh, and subsequently, we've had the whole family tested. And in fact, the whole the whole family are, are positive. So whilst I'm likely to be immune, I, I can't go back to the family and then go back to work. So sadly, I'm uh, in exile for the time being, George. Well, that is uh, bad news, and we all pray for their uh, full recovery and swiftly, because this is a very serious uh, epidemic, as we have consistently, for over a year, almost a year now, uh, been pointing out. My good friend, Abbas Uddin, was a healthy, fit, 40-year-old police officer, uh, a bit of a hero, a bit of a local hero, He's just died of it with no underlying conditions, no age at all. Uh, and that goes to show how deadly this is, no? It really does, George. And I'm, afraid, I'm very sorry for your loss. Um, and thank you for your well wishes. Again, my, my family, all very well. My children are young and they'll be fine, almost certainly. My wife, uh, it's had a very mild disease at present, and I'm hopeful that she'll also be fine, obviously. Um, but yes, this is it. we've reached some unenviable uh, milestones uh, this this last week. So we've, we're really touching probably this time tomorrow, uh, the world will wake up to find that there have been 100 million um, test-proven cases of COVID-19 uh, in the world. 100 million will represent one in 70 of the population. And it may be that actually very many more uh, than that have actually had it. But the, of those, we know there's been 2.1 million deaths. So if you multiply that by 70, if you were really to imagine that the whole world were to get that, you get a sense of what the death toll could be, despite the fact that for so many people, this is a mild disease. And, and again, that underlies all the strange 
aspects and the diff you know the difficulty the public have with kind of accepting it to an extent and perhaps our, our ruling class perhaps our, our political class also at first were just happy to say herd immunity is the way forward well they uh, i'm sad to say that they're getting their herd immunity excess mortality probably shows over 110,000 deaths and even just by counting the, the number of test proven cases in Britain alone uh, we are we're looking at 100,000 dead very shortly um, so the rate of um, uh, deaths this week has been uh, uh, phenomenal really uh, there have been 8,739 uh, people have died of coronavirus sadly this week and on a single day uh, though they all didn't die on that day, a single day notification of people who have died uh, with a test positive um, for coronavirus within the last 28 days. You know, uh, on Thursday, Wednesday, Thursday was 1,820 people, which is a, a shocking figure. We're still at three and a half thousand hospitalizations a day. And while the absolute rate of cases is now declining, no, no doubt, in the last uh, week we had 260,000 almost exactly cases down obviously from a couple of weeks ago when we were discussed after Christmas, it was more like 450,000. But these are still incredibly high numbers, meaning we have a very long way to go. And while the, some of the worst statistics are, are leveling, maybe plateauing, um, we're a long way from being out of the woods here, George. And you know that's despite the fact that lockdown has been in operation now for a good couple of weeks. The rollout of the vaccine, first of all, it was, I think, Tony Blair's uh, contribution to the great debate uh, that uh, giving people uh, just one jab and waiting a much longer period of time before giving them the second uh, would be uh, no great problem. But that is belied, including even by your own wife's case and your rather... Um, sobering assessment uh, that one jab might only give you about 30% protection. Therefore, you need two. And you need two because uh, the uh, models that we have chosen, when we could have chosen others, require two. Uh, and yet, so many millions of people, uh, although it's patchy across the United Kingdom, and we'll come back to that, uh, so many millions are not yet getting it. The English rollout has been best of all. Uh, the Welsh has shot up. The Scottish rollout has been absolutely pitiful. Uh, and I'm very angry about that because I live there. My mother lives there, my sister, my brother. Uh, the rollout in Scotland has been, I think I can say, disastrous so far. They are so far behind the English. How do you evaluate uh, the efficiency with which the state is rolling out these vaccines? Uh, thanks, George. Well, it's clear that there's not enough to go around. Um, my own father was called for his initial dose of vaccine. He had his appointment for a second dose of vaccine. He turned up for that appointment and was actually told to go away that he couldn't have the second dose, uh, though he hadn't been contacted uh, to tell him not to come for the appointment. And he's an elderly man and getting there was difficult. So clearly there's been a change. There was a period of time when you could see quite a number, perhaps half a million people uh, in the country received their uh, second dose, that was last week, and now that policy is absolutely being faded out. So it is quite strictly being applied now that only a single dose uh, is being given of either vaccine, either the AstraZeneca or the BioNTech vaccine. Uh, that includes the hospital population, that includes uh, the vulnerable and, and targeted population. And you're right to say that Tony Blair was the first one, really, who brought this up in the public discourse, reflecting his role, really, uh, since he's retired from you know, frontline uh, um, uh, politics. Frontline He's killing. Front, frontline killing, well, true, absolutely true in respect to his role uh, with the Iraq war and many other issues. Um, he's become a kind of international spokesperson for finance capital, for the extremely wealthy, advising lesser rulers, but also being the spokesperson of the really the, the richest companies, um, the richest magnets. Uh, and he's really got a tremendous amount of blood in his hands. But it also means that at crucial times, he pops up again in the national discourse 
and airs a policy. And, sh and you can be sure that whatever he floats will be taken very seriously and is very likely to become future policy. And again, we saw that uh, strangely in, in connection with the vaccine, something which he personally obviously has no expertise, but it shows you the, the, the way in which he's connected to the, the, the international finance capital, if you like, the ruling uh, elite of, of the most rich uh, part of the population. But yeah, I, I, I have serious misgivings about it. My wife's uh, um, disease has been mild. Uh, I know several people, um, colleagues, who in fact have had both doses of the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine and still test proven positive. If you look at the way that uh, uh, Pfizer ran their trial, they didn't actually test everyone. Um, they looked at their, their um, criteria was people who became symptomatic. And as we know, so many people are asymptomatic. It, it questions in you know the data itself, but we still haven't had the full release of the data from the Pfizer BioNTech trial. We're still essentially operating on the basis of its press release, and so I have limited reassurance from that. I think it's the best thing that we have available. But as I, as I've said time and again, this wasn't this wouldn't have been the vaccine of those that are available that I would have bought. So yes, a large number of people now have been vaccinated with at least one dose, and I think that number is uh, approaching five million. Yeah. Uh, and in the last week, in the order of uh, a million and a half, so that the scale of vaccination rollout is increasing. But I do have serious misgivings about the quality of the science upon which decisions are being made. Uh, and clearly this latest decision in terms of having a single dose versus two doses, this is one of political expediency, getting the most number. I'm not totally convinced yet, you know, that it's the best policy, if I'm frank. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, let's be clear, uh, not least for the censor, uh, we wholly support the vaccination of people against coronavirus. We have been in the front line of saying this is a deadly serious matter and we should have taken it more deadly seriously long before we did. We should have taken the best vaccine, not the one that made the most money uh, for the friends of the government uh, and big pharma. Uh, our position is clear, isn't it, doctor? I think it's pretty clear, George. Um... You know, we're in favor of science. We're in favor of using the science in the best way to help the population. But, you know, what, I, I, was, I, was start, I was listening to your program, George, and I was uh, startled to hear that uh, you were facing a ban from YouTube, perhaps on the basis of medical misinformation. I mean, there's an ongoing scientific debate going on about the best way to approach this. The, the policies have been vastly different across the globe. There's a huge amount of data available, but the data in the picture is emerging. Uh, and of course, no one knows the absolute truth or the absolute facts, including those who are actually in direction of policy. And that's why it's very important there is a healthy debate around this. So, you know, um, it would be interesting if you can get any more information from YouTube about what they feel was the medical misinformation. I do feel yeah. slightly responsible if it was my contribution. But I think essentially, you know, there's an emerging picture. Our, our picture will change. But yes, we've, we're, we've been wholly in favor of using science in terms of non-pharmaceutical me measures, but also science in terms of assessing the efficacy of those pharmaceutical measures and of the vaccine. And in general, we're supporters of the vaccine, despite my reservations I've had. Uh, and the full and, dose and of you've had it. And, Absolutely. And, and I'm demanding it, though living in Scotland, I'll probably be dead before I get it. Let's take a call. Sean is in Stevenage. Go ahead, Sean. Hey, George. How are you doing? Good. By the grace of God, thanks. <laughs> good, good. I, I wanted to ring you up, and, and, and first off, I'm, I'm sorry to hear about your friend. That died. It was a bitter blow, I must say. I, I can't get the thought of his two little girls yeah. uh, out of my mind, and yeah, how my beautiful a man he was, how yeah. vital he was. It's a bitter my, blow. Sean, go on. My sympathies to Dr. Brar and his family now being ill as well. It's uh, not you. good here. I, I just wanted to make a point, really, that... Um, you were you were talking about how angry you felt with people that were um, sort of denying this is a, a pandemic and and those type of things. Yeah. I, and I understand that. I understand that. Um, my old man's 84. He's got vascular dementia. He's been in a home for a couple of years, um, and it turns out he's now got COVID. I'm not going to blame those people that don't think there's a pandemic. Um, that aren't wearing their masks or whatever, if my old man goes, I am going to 100% put 
blame this government. Each and every one of these pilfering... Oh, well, <coughs> I don't swear, stop, don't swear. swear. I'm not going to swear. <coughs> Each and every one of them are to blame. As you said a minute ago, um, they should have done a lot more earlier on, and they didn't. And I, and I half think they were waiting for circumstances so they could make money out of it and give money backhanders and brown paper envelopes to their, to their friends to get in on, get their snouts in the trough. I'm not going to blame people. The, B, the BMJ published a survey, and they said something like compliance in Britain has been about 90%. And do you know what? For a civilian population, it doesn't understand about dispersion of particles in air and contamination, etc., to expect them to adopt protocols that you might kind of put in place in a high hazard facility uh, and then carry that on for 10 months, 10 months, with three supposed lockdowns, uh, what's the height of madness? Doing the same thing again and expecting another result? And here we are, and then folk wonder why people don't believe this political class who have lied to us over the decades... 40 years of running down the MH NHS, pro-privatisation policies, closing numerous hospitals and building nice little profitable privately run ones. Where did all those beds go? If we'd have had the same number of beds now that we had at the end of the 80s, probably double what we've got now, yes, the NHS would still be struggling, but we'd still have a lot more capacity to deal with this pandemic. Very Which powerful, very, very powerful call. Sean, uh, doctor, would you comment on it, please? Sean, first of all, I'm so sorry to hear the news about your father, but other than that, I could, you know, incredibly powerful call. I agree with George. I agree with every point you've made. Um, I was listening um, not too long ago, a couple of weeks perhaps, to um, Professor Marmot, who is the author of the Marmot Report, looking at health inequality in Britain. He published a very famous report about 10 years ago, and he published an update just before the pandemic hit, talking about why, in fact, um, health inequalities were increasing and the, and the age, the life expectancy of the population, um, the working class in particular, was starting to fall in Britain. And he pointed to a few things. Um, he pointed to um, uh, the fact that what was necessary to reduce health inequalities um, were uh, to reduce economic inequality. And that's been the opposite of the trend um, over the last 30, 40 years. He pointed to the fact that actually you had to have long-term investment in the NHS uh, to increase uh, systematic capacity. It couldn't be built up short-term, as we've seen with this pandemic. You can't just suddenly build a hospital and expect to be full of you know, ITU staff uh, or have other uh, facilities uh, to treat patients where they could be socially isolated. They have to be planned for in advance. There has to be that capacity and the willingness and the desire to care uh, for the needs of the ordinary working class people. And he said it's about quality of leadership uh, that would long term look at that direction. And you can see how starkly those points have been brought out, how, yes, our government individually have absolutely failed, but it's also been the culmination of a period of long you know, attempt to privatise the NHS. There was a very powerful and, and, and uh, uh, contribution made by a, a friend of mine, Bob Gill, uh, uh, who's a GP and an NHS campaigner, when he said, look, look, Oliver Letwin and John Redwood, when they were just junior ministers working for Thatcher, we know them all too well now, and they wrote a, 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 a booklet uh, called Britain's Biggest Industry about how you go about um, privatising the NHS. And every single one of those steps has been followed and implemented by successive governments. And just if I, as I am answering your call, but with that last point, that, that if you look at what's just happened, a, a, a document, a consultation document with the public has gone out, very innocuous language. It was up on their website for, for, for until just about a week ago, asking people what they thought about the concept of an integrated healthcare system. And what they're doing is int integrated sounds great. It's all going to work together and work very well. But really what they're talking about is the ability of... Um, of financial interest, large financial interest, the health insurance to come in and actually partner with clinical commissioning groups and then in a way that they say fit, adjust standards, adjust monitoring, decide on rationing of care, but basically fully privatise the budget. There'll be huge contributions from government, but they'll go into the remit of these private companies, we'll have health passports, we'll have limited access to care and increasingly 
insurance will not just be uh, you know for the privileged few everyone will need it if they're going to guarantee their care and far from protecting the nhs you know, this pandemic itself has been used to deliver the final hammer bros. And on the back of it, another debate about how we improve things. You can bet, well, you'll bet on dollar that if Boris Johnson launches um, an inquiry into the mishandling of his own government in this pandemic, they will absolutely use it to spearhead this radical change where Accenture and uh, large uh, other, other large um, health insurance companies, um, particularly uh, those, for example, that Simon uh, Stevens actually worked for. Simon Stevens is the director of our NHS, but was actually for 10 years a major player in the boardroom of a company called United Health, who have a budget of hundreds of billions of dollars. These companies, the entire direction of policy is to privatize the NHS, and it's precisely for those reasons, the economic inequality, the running down on privatization of our NHS, that we're seeing the terrible figures, the shameful figures, where Britain, the sixth richest country on earth, has the highest death rate, apart from a tiny handful of countries like San Marino, there's semi-statelets, perhaps Belgium, in the world. Uh, so I think, you know, I, I'm sorry for your personal loss. I think sorry for personal loss of so many people have suffered. Behind these statistics, there's real pain and it's reflecting of a real inequality in society. And there's no current plan by our government or the opposition to address it and put it right. And increasingly, it's going to fall to us outraged as we are and pain as we are to try and address it. And so thanks so much for your call, Sean. Thank you, Sean, and God bless your father. I am very sorry indeed uh, to hear that news. Um, we hope that he pulls through. Uh, let's take one more then, doctor, if you will. Ashley is in Hampshire. Ashley, welcome. Hello, George, how are you? Yeah, good, thanks. Not bad at all. Hello. Yes, go ahead, Ashley, you're on I, the air. I, I, Wonderful. So, yeah, it was just um, so I was just basically just wanted to voice my sort of concerns with we've been in lockdown for an, for about a year now, like through lockdowns, you see the rise in domestic abuse, alcohol and drug abuse, suicide. Like we've just had a, a 12 year old take his own life. Bless him. Like there's the, the, the government, the elites, whatever you want to call them, Matt Hancock, Boris Johnson, they have no concept of reality like these people are just the general people that you mainstream like go to Eton, not really lived a full sort of let's say working class life and these people are just they're laughing in our faces like you see the interviews on this morning and you see matt hancock just smirking and just he couldn't even bring himself to just even just take himself off his high horse and just apologize or even admit that he was in the wrong with these school mills, and it took a professional footballer that plays for Man Manchester United, that's not even his job, he doesn't even get paid to be involved with the country, and it took a professional footballer to go onto Twitter, onto social media, to push our Prime Minister to actually acknowledge that th these school mills weren't acceptable. Like, and uh, another thing, like... Um, briefly, the, Ashley, the briefly. And stuff, and... The protesters being such heavy-handed by the police over whatever whatever this police state that we're going towards, and they're trying to wipe out small, medium businesses. I'm, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but you can see. It, like, I've never been into politics, but it's just they're just laughing at us, really. Like, it's, well, uh, it's, look, uh, we we fully support uh, lockdown. Uh, we uh, argued for a proper, real lockdown much earlier. We argued against that lockdown being lifted, but we demanded that the living standards of the working people in the country had to be supported by the state and not money siphoned off to cronies and friends, not money wasted on schemes that didn't work because of the incompetence they set up to operate them. And we remain absolutely committed to fighting this pandemic. We don't think people should be out in big crowds demonstrating about it. Not now, but there will come a time when there will have to be a reckoning. Last word to you, Dr. Ranjit. Thanks, George. Yeah, I think, you know, it's, it's really important to consider all of the fate especially of the most marginalized, the poorest, the most vulnerable. Uh, during the entire period of this year, uh, with the crash in the economy, a world capitalist economic crisis, 
uh, as well as the brief periods of lockdown. But we, when you look at what our government has done, they have not done lockdown. Lockdown can mean anything, any, any combination of measures. And whilst there have been moments when they've said, don't go anywhere, look at currently what's happening. 20 million people are going to work every day. 25% of our children are still in school despite the lockdown. So, yes, it's for every measure that our government taken, whether it's financial bailout, which has been, you know, if you look at the United States, they've given $3 trillion directly to the U.S. stock market, and they're offering pennies, you know, cents, a few dollars to their working population, nothing. So all of the relief goes to the wealthiest in society, not to the people who need it to actually stay at home. That's not lockdown. And a similar thing has happened in our country. All the relief will go to those who are wealthiest, a medium amount to those who are relatively well off. And actually the poorest and most marginalized are least able to access it, least able to be able to isolate, and therefore they will go out. So our non-pharmaceutical measures have been wrong from the start. There's been no attempt to really address them. So, you know, it's, it's hypocritical to assert that our government has really been aiming at protecting the population. What they really have done effectively is herd immunity, and that's why the virus has spread so rampantly throughout the population. That being said, the, the crude measure that they have used is the only thing that they've done successfully that has slightly tended to retard the rate of infection. They haven't followed it up, they haven't eliminated the virus, and therefore, infectious as it is, they haven't really done anything. So I entirely agree with you that our government is to blame. I entirely agree with you that the working class and most marginalised have suffered most. And perhaps, you know, you should look at your last statement that you've never been in, involved in politics. Everything you said is political. Everything you said actually is against the prevailing order, against the status quo, against the government of money, in favour of working people. And it's high time that working people became organised because the only way we can address these problems and start to change them, particularly when you look at the smirking faces of the ministers who know they have no accountability, who know that if they serve the interests of the very wealthy well in office, when they're out of office, they'll be handsomely rewarded. That's the corruption in and our not even country. Opposed. That's why Tony Blair has personal wealth of 400, 300, 400 million. So it's high time you became involved in politics. I think everything you said points to the fact that people like you, the ordinary working people of Britain, do have the answer. Sorry to go on, George. Not at all. Uh, and they don't even have an opposition facing them uh, in Parliament uh, or in most of the media, for that matter. Ashley, get involved in politics. Dr. Bra, uh, I really hope everything is fine at home and that you can go home soon, that everyone pulls through. And to the censor, don't misunderstand anything that we have said here tonight. Because this is democracy. This is an open university of the airwaves. And we have to argue through all of the things that we're doing, all of the things we ought to have done, all of the things we should be doing now. We're not parrots sitting here parroting Matt Hancock's latest twist. Thank you, Dr. Bra, for joining us. Coming up after the break.